Hi, this is Dale, and welcome to our introductory lecture on the Book of Judges. So the first thing we need to talk a bit about is what this course is about. And that should be pretty easy. First of all, the course is about the Book of Judges, as you might expect. That's probably why you signed up. And second, the book is also an overview of the field of biblical studies, or what is sometimes called biblical criticism. So as we go through the book of Judges, we're also going to see how different aspects of the field of biblical studies looks at Judges. And so by the end of the course, you should have at least a sense of some of the many different ways that biblical studies approaches the study of the Bible. So what is the book of Judges? Well, first, and maybe even foremost, it's part of a grouping of books called the Former Prophets. And I'm not sure if you've ever heard this term before, but sometimes uh, the parts of the Old Testament after the Torah are referred to as the Former Prophets, and then we have what are called the Latter Prophets, what you would normally think of like um, Hosea and Micah and Amos and so forth. Uh, but the book of Judges is part of the former prophets, so the earlier prophets, the prophets that come earlier in the book. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, how is Judges prophecy? And we may even have to further ask ourselves, well, what do we think of when we think of prophecy? Typically, we think of prophecy as something that is looking towards the future or telling the future or... Uh, warning us about what the future holds if we um, or the reader doesn't correct their ways. But prophecy is also about criticism in some ways. So if you look at some of the latter prophets, they talk about all of the things that Israel is doing wrong and needs to correct. So <clears throat> based on this category, we have to think about how judges works as criticism. So Judges is part of a body of literature that is critical of the Israelites, that criticizes them for the things they're doing wrong. So this is really, really interesting if you're used to studying literature in other parts of the ancient Near East. So what we mean by that is Egyptian literature, uh, Akkadian literature, Babylonian literature, so um, uh, civilizations that grew up in Mesopotamia um, and so forth. Typically, their writings, at least the writings that we have, are devoted solely to extolling the greatness of their particular country or empire. So they talk about how great their kings were, how many people they killed in battle, everything was just wonderful, and uh, sort of each king gets its own a liturgy of self-praise. The, the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, is completely different from that. So it is largely literature um, that, yes, conveys the story of Israel, but also criticizes Israel. So I can't really think even of any large body of literature of any other civilization uh, that was contemporary to the Israelites, where they go on and on about how bad they were. So um, that is something to keep in mind when you're reading Judges. So if we read of a specific act or deed in Judges, we can't necessarily assume that the author approves of what's happening. In fact, it probably, or at least possibly, could just be the opposite. So sometimes we read something in the Bible, like the Israelites do something, and there's really no outright condemnation of it. So we think, hmm, they must have approved of this, or God must have approved of this action. Well, given that the tenor of the entire set of literature, or this entire piece of the biblical literature, is more or less headed toward criticizing the Israelites, we have to be super careful about making assumptions that the writer approves of what the writer is talking about. So just something to keep in mind as we go through this course. So what else is the book of Judges? Well, it's a collection of stories that um, are related to a specific phase of development 
of the Israelites as a people. So I mentioned in one of the other videos that this is sort of an in-between phase for the Israelites. The uh, era of Moses and his divine appointed successor Joshua has clearly passed, and the people don't really quite know or understand what is to come next. So it's a place of waiting, it's a place of confusion, it's a place of things not working like you think they should work or like you've gotten used to them working. So it's a it's very um, specific phase of development. So it's also a collection of stories that are about the question of leadership and God's choice of leaders. And by the end of this course, uh, this is something else I think I mentioned in one of the other videos, you're going to be asking yourself, why in the world would God pick these people to be leaders? And it's a really good question to be asking. And I would argue, you don't necessarily have to agree to me, that the stories all somehow relate to the theme of justice. So as we go through the course, I'll try to point more specifically how I think this works in the book. This is sort of one of the, the things that I've discovered and has a lot of meaning to me and makes the book come alive for me. You may not agree with me, but I think it's an interesting way of looking at the various stories. Are sometimes, maybe always, difficult to interpret. So. Sometimes you just get a little, particularly in the first pa first chapter of Judges, you get little stories, um, for example, about a king who has his big fingers and or his uh, thumbs and toes cut off, big toes. And you read that and you wonder, what am I supposed to learn from that? You know, what is this part of the story trying to tell trying to tell me? And it's really not always clear. And that can be very frustrating for us who are used to trying to come up with a right answer. We live in a scientific age that gives definitive answers to things, and sometimes the answer is not definitive, I would argue. So that can be frustrating, but also kind of fun. And sometimes the stories are ruthlessly violent. So as I mentioned in the other video, uh, some of the most violent, if not the vi most violent stories in the Bible are in the book of Judges. So the book of Judges is part of what scholars, so this is sort of the scholarly side of seeing the book of Judges, is part of what is known as the Deuteronomistic history. That's a very, very long word, a word that took me a lot of practice to get to spell right. And sometimes it's abbreviated in different ways, but sometimes it's abbreviated with this sort of DTH abbreviation. You'll see other abbreviations. So what do we mean by that? <clears throat> so a scholar named Martin Noth, who lived in the um, 1900s, in the 20th century, uh, came up with this term. And he discovered and I think has proved to the satisfaction of most biblical scholars that there is a commonality between a number of books in the Bible, or a number of books particularly in this section of the Bible, and he's the first one to refer to this as the Deuteronomistic history. Uh, in the kind of later 20th century, Frank Moore Cross came up with some more um, sophisticated theories about how these books were put together, sort of how they were edited. Um, so if you're familiar with the Books of Kings, and you go sort of towards the end of the Books of Kings, um, you can sort of see that there was a particular ending for the book, or what looks like a, an ending of the book around the reign of Josiah. And that later, more additional information was added on to the book to sort of update the reader like, well, what happened after Josiah? Well, what happened after Josiah is that the Israelites uh, were conquered by foreign powers. So, and that's pretty important. So Cross said, well, really, um, you know, in each sort of edition of the book, there was a new sort of take on what had happened. So we know how the story ends. Uh, that Israel, Israel is conquered. Um, and so 
um, with each successive rewriting, maybe a couple of drafts, maybe two or three drafts, um, the story sort of took on a different shape. But that DTH, uh, the Deuteronomistic History, overall tells one more or less continual story with a particular theological perspective. So these books are Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, both books of Samuel, and Kings, both books of Kings. So taken as a group, these books have a common theology. And the common theology is overall, again, sort of stepping back and looking at the big picture, is explaining why Israel fell to foreign invaders. And the answer that um, the Bible gives us is that Israel's fell to foreign invaders because um, you know, they were not faithful to Yahweh, first of all, but they had really bad leaders. So if you read the books of Kings, there are not very many good kings in, uh, in the books of Kings. And even Solomon, uh, worshipped foreign gods. You know, we kind of think of him as the founder of the temple, should be a good guy, but the books are very, very critical. So uh, we should kind of keep that end in mind when we're reading specific parts of Judges. And as a result, because Israel fell to foreign invaders because of their bad leadership, prim primarily, I would say, um, we also have to take a closer look at the issue of leadership. What kind of leadership does it seem that God desires for Israel? What kind of leadership do they pursue and explore? And so we'll be talking about leadership. And in the end, it justifies why kings are a bad idea. So when you, when you finish Judges, you think, oh, please, uh, let's have a king because this place is just chaos. But actually, overall, uh, kings are not, uh, do not end up being a good thing for the Israelites. And I'll show you why this is true a little bit later on in the course. So let's flip to the other side and talk about biblical criticism. So biblical criticism does not equal criticizing the Bible. Uh, it could mean criticizing the Bible, but it doesn't necessarily mean criticizing the Bible. So that's one important thing to get out of the way. Second, biblical criticism has its roots in the Reformation. So it's, it's kind of a Reformation, beginning of the modern era movement. And the first point is to return to a non-allegorical, plain reading of the Bible. And this is a little complicated, but prior to the Reformation, in 1517-ish, when the uh, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on uh, the walls of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Um, the Bible was often read in an allegorical way. So if we read something, say, for example, in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, the Bible talks about the fact that five rivers flowed out of Eden, and then it names uh, those five rivers. And an allegorical reader would take those five rivers and say that, well, these rivers don't really mean anything. They're actually symbolic of other things. So there was one famous interpretation where the five rivers actually represented the five heroic virtues. Now, there's nothing in the text that leads us to believe that rivers represent virtues. I guess you can sort of see how that might make sense, but it's not something that we modern people would have come up with. So readings that are very symbolic, where it seems like um, we're not trying to focus on what's actually happening in the text, but it's actually talking about some other spiritual reality and not anything that happened in the material world, um, those things became sort of collapsed with the Reformation because people um, started reading their own Bibles for themselves and they realized that oftentimes allegorical interpretations um, were just something somebody made up and yeah it might sound good but there's really no basis for that. 
Along with that, the Bible was translated into the vernacular languages. So um, people didn't need to rely as, nearly as much on theologians for their biblical interpretation. They could read the Bible themselves, at least if they knew how to read. But the idea of biblical criticism did not really begin in earnest uh, until the time of Baruch Spinoza, who was an Enlightenment philosopher, and he published something called the Tractatus Theologico-Politicus. Uh, it's a sort of a high-sounding name, but you can get it available in English now. You don't have to read it in Latin. And this was published in 1677. And what Spinoza said is that theologians use the Bible not, they don't take the Bible on its own terms, but rather they have a set of uh, assertions or a set of doctrines or something that they want to prove, and they kind of flip through the Bible and they look for proof text to support their ideas. So Spinoza says, really, we're going about this all wrong. We need to actually focus on the ideas that are actually in the Bible and then see if what we believe really does flow from the Bible. So he's kind of criticizing uh, popular theologians of his time. He lived in Amsterdam. He was a excommunicated Jew, so he really had nothing to lose in terms of uh, kind of criticizing the way people approach the Bible. And uh, what Spinoza did, and uh, this gains a lot of momentum in the, in the 19th century, is he focused a lot on asking questions like, who wrote the Bible? So up until this time, people uh, didn't really question who wrote the Bible, or they, they said, well, Moses wrote uh, the first five books, and then, I don't know, maybe Samuel wrote part of Samuel, even though Samuel dies in the middle of Samuel, and I, people didn't focus on that. But Spinoza started asking these questions, and people um, worked on those questions, but they also worked on the question of what was going on historically at the time the Bible was written. So kind of the Bible in its historical context became a new thing, and a lot of people devoted a lot of time to this. So it's gained a lot of momentum in the 19th century, so we came up with the documentary hypothesis in that uh, the first five books, the documentary hypothesis is essentially that the first five books of the Bible are actually a composite work and not the work of one author. Um, things like archaeology began, so a whole new uh, set of, uh, kind of a whole new discipline grew out of this. Sort of started off as being more or less treasure hunting, uh, kind of Indiana Jones sort of thing, and then eventually became um, serious, serious science or serious uh, serious analysis of what, uh, how people lived in the biblical period. Language study increases exponentially. So one thing that Spinoza uh, pushed is that we need to learn the original languages of the Bible. And even though uh, that seems to be tapering off at the present time, uh, much to my dismay since I spent a lot of time <laughs> learning Hebrew and Greek and other languages, um, but people began to really study Hebrew. And then eventually in the 20th century, we had things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and started looking at the development of the Hebrew language. A whole new um, discipline of comparative Semitics began. And um, again, just an explosion of knowledge. And all of that movement culminates in what is now generally referred to as the historical critical method. And what the historical critical method is, is it attempts to discover um, the setting, the historical setting in which the Bible was written and all of the questions that go along with that. After the um, advent of people that studied under what is generally called historical uh, criticism, new methods sprung up. So we had things um, that could be broadly classified. These are sort of classifications of different methods based on 
the types of work that the biblical scholars do. So we had social scientific methods. Um, these are methods that look at the culture of the ancient Israelites, their family structure, uh, how they lived, uh, the role of women, the role of children, um, how their culture might have uh, been the same or different from surrounding cultures. All of these are social scientific methods. So the social sciences are primarily uh, sociology and anthropology. So they look at uh, the nation of Israel as a sociologist or as an anthropologist would look at a group of people today. There are also literary methods. Uh, literary methods read the Bible basically uh, in the same way that you would read uh, a book or a, uh, a work of literature. So they're looking for things like, uh, you know, what, what is the plot? How does this character develop? What do we know about the character? What don't we know? What, what does the character say? How does the character say it? Um, how do uh, these stories relate to other stories that are like it or that are right around it? What does this tell us about how the plot is developing? So these aren't uh, methods that rely on any kind of historical context, but they're looking at um, the words on the page and trying to understand them as we would understand literature done under a very close reading. So sometimes this is called the a close reading of the Bible. So we're looking at every word. We're looking at every nuance of every word to try to figure out what is really there? You know, word, things like word choice, like why did why do we think the author chose this word and not that word? Things like that. There are also things that are generally classified under ideological criticism. So this is including feminist approaches. And what we mean by this is that people um, that sort of come from a specific place, uh, their own location, if you will. Uh, in the Bible um, started writing uh, different responses to what they were reading in the Bible. So we will read an example of this a little bit later on in the quarter. So um, Judges 19, for example, um, talks about uh, the horrendous and brutal rape of an Israelite woman. And that story, perhaps, I, I would contend, yes, um, is heard and differently by a woman than it is by a man. At least that's what ideological criticism would contend. And they would try to point out um, how a woman might read this particular text differently. That's sort of an extreme approach, but that's something that a, a feminist critic would definitely look at. Um, they would also look at how women are portrayed in the Bible, how women are seem to be in power or powerless. It could be either one. Um, and how does women's power work? Sort of issues like that. But ultimately, each method asks a different type of questions about the biblical text. And that's probably the most important thing to get out of this part of the lecture is that we we sort of look at all of the possible questions that people are asking about the Bible and trying to figure out, and we kind of tend to categorize them in uh, these general categories. So a lot of it has to do with the types of questions you're asking. Now that doesn't mean that one scholar can't ask different types of questions, even in the same article or the same paper. Um, so sometimes you could start off a paper by doing historical critical analysis and then say, but I'm going to now look at this from a literary perspective and kind of try to see how those two things work together or maybe they don't work together. So these kind of strict boundaries, even though we've set them out here as very strict categories, don't really work in the real world this way. So people cross over and do a lot of things simultaneously and a lot of times we don't even really notice that necessarily, but um, it's good to see how, the, um, how the, the field of biblical studies uh, 
looks at things and how they sort of divvy things up. So as we go through the course, we'll be talking more about methods of studying the Bible. And I hope if you have questions about that, you will please, please ask. And um, some of that information will be important for you for the midterm exam. So that's your overview of what we're doing in this course. I hope you found that at least a little helpful, and we'll be talking to you soon. Take care. Again, let me know if you have any questions.